I want to say thank you for coming. This is our first time having people since March. I wanted to look up the date, but I didn't have time. I mean, 20. 20, March 2020. So you are our, our test guinea pigs. <laughs> we actually did have a big concert outside, which I don't know if anyone got to come, but that was a lot of fun. But it's our first time having people in Mars meeting, so we had to remember how to get everything to work again. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. Um, we are very happy to have Jackie Skrivinsky joining us today, and um, she has been a director of fashion and marketing and a professor at Kingsborough Community College at City University of New York for over 30 many years. I say it's probably more than that now. And another just interesting thing, which I know Penny always mentioned, but there is a collection that was yeah, donated. I donated in memory of my parents. Of American and international fashion books. There's a whole section, I don't know if you have ever seen it, and it does have the plaque with your parents', my parents names on it. So it's if you're interested in fashion, um, which I am, and I've had time to look at some of those books, it's really fabulous. That was a nice contribution to the library. Um, and she's also been involved in many community things over the years, including serving as board on the History Museum right. for a period, and also on the board of the Friends right. of the Library, right. a project from our library at some point. And she's been a huge asset to our library in so many ways, including doing many programs like the one she's going to today. So everyone, please welcome to Kathy's Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so happy to be out of the house. Um, more than two years, I guess. I have gone to Atlanta twice. It's a different world we're living in right now. But you know, talking about the Hamptons, it's so it's such a big topic, really. You know, um, what is the Hampton style? I mean, um, I was in the you know I live in the village, and so I walk a lot, and, and I look at what people are wearing, and you know, you might everyone has their own concept of what style is. And I was uh, just to show you, do you think this is the Hampton style? This is something typical. We would see someone walking down the street during the middle of the day, maybe going shopping or going to pick something up at Cinderella's, maybe. Um, and those of us who <coughs> frequent stop and shop, the grocery store we love to hate, um, here's another interesting view. And here's some nice young ladies, again, um, there appear to be a lot of shorts, obviously because the sun was hot, sandals of course, um, you know, nothing very unusual. Here we have a lady checking out. Over here are three friends at the corner of um, Hampton Road and you know, the Main Street chatting. And then I saw these young women, very cute, with very short shorts crossing the main street. So I think it's really what you feel comfortable wearing, really. Um, you know, um, what do you think the Hampton style is? What do you like to wear? What do you see? What do, you, do you think is a, a uniform? Mm -hmm. Very casual. Casual. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the COVID has pushed us into a very casual lifestyle, too. The Prince. The what? Prince? The Prince, yes. And you probably for fall will be a lot. I've named them too much for it myself. I call the flower dresses the oh, July yes, yes. look. Yes, right. well, I think oh. um, Stephen Solson, one of the uh, village uh, photographers, had a whole page in the press of women wearing those flower printed dresses. You know, so it's kind of nice to go to a beautiful party or something because it's summery and it always looks good. You know, uh, there's no, you know, there's no uh, limit as to who can wear it. But you know, the Hamptons really started. Uh, very early on. Um, Southampton Village wasn't incorporated until 1894. But before that, uh, back to 19, you know, early, early, um, there were, uh, you know about the, um, the summer cottages that lined Gin Lane uh, and Meadow Lane, were, some were built as early as 1877 um, through 1927, really. Um, and about after the hurricane of 38, only about 19 survived. I can show you the uh, map. I have to use my finger now. Yeah. I think my, my mouse is. Here we go. Here we go. So you can see 
So here we see, um, this is 1894-1916, um, the earlier year below, and you can see um, all the uh, all the inscriptions here are the various cottages built um, beginning in 1877 and going through 1927, um, so that there were about 38 cottages, as they were called, very big houses, not something we imagine when we think of a cottage on Jin Lane. And actually, I found out that the main Jin Lane was really from a particular wheat or uh, some kind of a greenery that, grow, that grows in that area, and so that name stuck for that part of the um, of Southampton. And also, you know, early on, uh, back to 1870, an acre of land cost somewhere around $200 or more, which was a lot of money in those days. So this was always a very wealthy community that was obviously accessed by the very few. Um, now, there were a lot of things that fostered uh, what we now call this so here we see a very kind of stylish group of people. Um, this is 1894. Um, and then the mo one of the most important things that happened was the railroad. The Long Island Railroad came through in about 1832. But prior to that, there was a doctor by the name of Theodore Gillard Thomas who traveled out here in a horse and buggy to visit and saw how beautiful it was. And he fell in love with the area. And so he came back. And after the Long Island was established, he encouraged his uh, female um, patients to travel to this place to benefit from the bucolic environment. He encouraged what we call the social sale in Manhattan.
and again, uh, there was a gentleman, and it was very formal, obviously. Um, these are upper class people, and look at the gentleman, they always had the, the straw fedoras on, and the women always wore large hats, beautiful long dresses. This was a typical summer outing for them. And we even see here, in a, in a glimpse of East Hampton, walking along the street, um, how beautiful it was, and how lovely it was. Um, so, the artists in the late 1800, the formal school of painting, um, and Sam Parrish at the same time established the Southampton Art Museum on uh, Jokes Lane. Uh, Fairfield Porter, I don't know if you know, the very famous painter, in 1949 moved to South Main Street. A lot of his paintings are held by the Parrish Art Museum now that they are in Warner Mill. And, they, and he, Mr. Parr, Mr. Uh, Porter, lived on South Main Street, his house still stands. As a matter of fact, um, Penny Wright, who was the former director here, her family lived in a large brick house right next to Fairfield Porter's house. So there were very close um, connections between the two. So there were, there were a lot of wealthy institutions that happened as a result of all of this. So because we had all these people who came out here, uh, they were very social. And so there were some very important um, institutions, like the Meadow Club. Now, if you've never been down, down um, Halsey Neck Lane and driven down to the Meadow Club, you should, because you'll see the beautiful lawn tennis um, um, areas that they have, especially um, during the summertime, you'll see people playing lawn tennis. But at the Meadow Club, uh, starting about 1905, very early, Ladies had to wear white gloves and straw hats, and men had to wear blue blazers and white flannel trousers. So this is a beautiful shot on their lawn tennis courts. Further, here's another wider shot of it. This is a beautiful shot of how beautiful and bucolic that area was um, playing tennis outside. And then we also had the Bathing Corporation. Um, that was also very exclusive. And in the beginning, it was restricted to people who were in the Blue Book. So if you weren't in the social registry, you weren't allowed to have a membership. Maybe you couldn't afford it, but that was the rule of the day. And here's another view of the Southampton Beach Club. It's the same thing, the Bathing Beach Club. One of the same. This is a 1920 shop. And then, of course, other people came. The ocean draws everyone. That's what makes Southampton. Without the ocean, I don't think anyone would come here, even if they don't swim. Um, it's something about it. It's the light. It's the color. It's the feeling. Um, there's something special about the light. That's why we have so many artists. Fearful Porter, Lady Mary Chase. There's the light that captured there. Pollock came out here, he has a studio that's preserved in, um, outside of East Hampton in Springs. So um, it, was a, it really drew a lot of the artistic um, people that they really found this place really beautiful. So we had a lot of people that came to swim. And here we have what they might have worn on the beach. Certainly very avant-garde for those days. I don't, it would be kind of clumsy for us to wear them, but um, they seem absolutely happy to be on the beach and being able to go up to the water. And most of those swimsuits were wool. So when you got in the water, and got out of this heavy, you know, wool, when it gets wet, it's really heavy. And so that's what they were faced with. So it's kind of interesting that, um, so again, this was, oops. Now, not to say that, you know, you have to remember that, um, there were other people that lived here as well. This, these were the very upper class people that lived here. There was a whole bunch of working class people, the farmers particularly, the immigrants later after the war who came and worked on the estates. My husband's grandfather was one of them. He worked on one of the estates on Jim Lane. That was a little house in the village. Today, no one would have to do that. So here we see a little later uh, shot of a modern. So just to compare what happened in the 50s as compared to what happened in the 1800s of how women's uh, bathing suits changed. So from 1910 to the 50s, 
what a change, a complete change. Um, so as we, um, and the other thing that's important about the Hamptons were the writers. <laughs> You might recognize this place, Bobby Vance in the Hampton. These are the four famous guys uh, in front of Bobby Vance. Uh, they are Jim Capote, uh, Willie Morris, John Knowles, and James Jones. This became their water and home. This was in the 70s. So by the 70s, actually the writers started coming right during the war, the Second World War, as a haven for a lot of the persecution that they were experiencing in the city. So they found a, a place out here, not only in Southampton, but and later on, uh, Bobby Vance became a very important spot for guides and writers to meet. Um, as the community grew, it led to the establishment of Southampton College in 1965, I believe. And the Rogers Memorial Library was a result of these writers who were out here promoting the importance of literature and learning. Okay. So the writers were important. And then, of course, after the writers, <laughs> the celebrities. Okay, they really put us on the map. Now we all recognize this handsome man, Gary Cooper, with his uh, wife in 1930. And this is in front of the beach club. Um, and look what they're wearing. You know, very formal. She has her turban hat on, very 40 ish. Um, sort of a tr uh, trousers, like harem trouser pants. Um, he has a casual suit on, but still the suit with the white collar coat and tassel loafers. That was a really very important shoe because it's still Southampton today. A lot of preppy people love wearing tassel loafers. And this lady, if you don't know who she is, Diana Vreeland. Diana Vreeland was the editor of Vogue, very famous woman very stylish, and here she is going into the beach club, and she has her shorts on. This is the 40s. She has her stretch tube top on. We're still wearing them, right? Some of us. She has her snood on at the back of her hair. She has a snood to capture her longer hair, and of course her sandals, and she carries a little umbrella for the heat and a little purse. This was a typical look. This was, again, um, part of society. Among the very famous people, too, at that time, was the wedding of Henry Ford II and his wife, Anne MacDonald. They were married here in 1940. So you can see how formal, formally the bridesmaids were dressed, as well as the bride and the groom. And as we move to the 50s, um, I don't know how many of you know about Herb McCarthy. Herb McCarthy had a, a bar a restaurant and Corn of Oak Square, which now sits the human sits. Um, and he established this in the 50s, and this is a picture of him when he was very young on the left, and then in 1986 on the right when he closed his place. My husband and I, in March of 86, were out here in the winter, and I had never been there. My husband grew up here, he knew all about her McCarthy, so we went there. We were the only people in the restaurant, and he was just so charming and lovely. Um, I know that it was important to the social set here in Southampton, but he was a very generous man, and uh, his institution was the spot. Open 36, closed in 86. Um, if we look at this woman right here, C.D. Guest, who was a very famous socialite, was one of the people who frequented um, Bowdoin Square institution. It was taken from her in 1953. Again. She has like a one piece, like this linen teddy on. This gentleman, his wife, that's his third wife. This is Igor Cassini, known as Holly Knickerbocker. This was in 19, um, this was in the 50s, going again, to, walking to the beach club. Again, he's wearing those sort of soft white pants. I'll show that any guy would wear today. I don't think it's changed that much. Of course, the um, shorts again. And she has like a little halter top. And these ladies are the Gabors. And notice how they're going to the beach. They have their gloves, their hats, handbags. They're very dressed up. And these are the Mary girls. 
Mills, Catherine Murray McManus, and her sister in 1950s. And again, very preppy looking as the 50s were, with the shorts on these bicycles, these Rollies, uh, were built around that time, maybe a little later, but um, with a little basket on the front. And if you notice, they're Agawam is in the back, so they're in front of the beach club, getting ready to go in, park your bikes, um, arriving at the beach club. There were lots of social sets along the village. Now on Wyandanch Lane, which is a really beautiful street from the village, um, this is a group of regulars, among whom are Angie Biddle Duke, who you may know um, died one day. Um, uh, he was um, rollerblading on Jim Lane. And but this was a typical group that would meet, you know, impromptu in someone's home, you know, with their um, little outfits. Here we have Mrs. John Randall Hurst, Jr., and her husband, playwright Thomas Phillips. Again, look at the shoes the men have on, no socks. No socks. A lot of guys will do that. No socks with the loafers. Again, the, the plaid shirt, the shorts, she looks the same, short shorts with a little blouse. Nothing extreme, you know, not very, uh, just very simple. And here we have Charlotte and Ann Ford. Notice the hair ladies, very teased. Zip, probably use a can of hairspray to get it like that. So they all wear those printed shirts, same sh uh, shorts. They have very formal handbags too, not very soft. Um, but um, yeah, we're, in the, we're leaning into the 60s now. And here we have Mary McFadden with her date, 1960. So there's a whole social life going on as well. This would be something, she was a designer, so she was very advanced in what she wore as compared to many other people. <laughs> and of course, here's a young group of debutante um, women who are about to be, uh, to have their debut. And this was a party, um, this was in 1960, and Little Duke, young, is kneeling in front of the young lady there. So the debutantes were part of this whole social set, the social debts. And one of the most important people out here is Mrs. Kennedy. And this is just a beautiful picture of her um, taken when she was in the Hamptons. A very simple, notice that she's wearing very classic, but she dressed that way. She dressed very classically. This is typical of something she would wear. Um, it was not a surprise. Let me go back just a minute, a little bit, uh, before we move on. Um, well, let me just go and finish the section. And here we have Gloria Vanderbilt, who also had a home in Southampton with her family and her two sons, one of whom I think must be Anderson Cooper. I don't know which one it is, but um, this is her home. And of course, Dina Merrill. Not only was she an actress, but she was part of the social registry. She's the daughter of Ian Hutton and Marjorie Merriweather in Post. So here she is recently. This is a recent photo of her. There is still a very beautiful I just wanted to tell you something about, um, you know, in the early days of Southampton, you know, there were a lot of you know, other people, obviously, other than socialites. Um, my colleague and I, Nina Kennedy, and I wrote a lot of books about Southampton's world histories. We must have read about eight books. Um, I brought with me today one of our books, which I hope you will take a copy of. Please feel free to take one home, and you'll read about some of the real people in Southampton. This place, what it is. But one of the gentlemen that we interviewed very early on was a man, a man by the name of Ben Babcock. He was in his 90s when we met him. And the reason we went to see him was we heard he made these great cream puffs. So we wanted the recipe. We started out thinking we were going to do a cookbook, but we ended up doing oral history. So this is what he said. He was born in 1913. So this was like in the 30s when his wife and he belonged to a group called the Cotillion Club. During the war, he said, girls from down south met the boys from Southampton stationed there. After they married and came to Southampton, the girls had cotillion dances. The men had to wear tuxedos. The girls had to wear long evening gowns. You had to be properly dressed, black or dark colored patent leather shoes, white shirts. At one of the dances, a local chap, I won't say his name, he came with a blue shirt, formal with ruffles. He got a letter from the committee saying he had not properly dressed. Next time, he wore a white shirt and sneakers. <laughs> <laughs> so that was his way of getting back at them. But 
you know, that shows you that there was another slice of Southampton where there were some kind of dress codes, not just for the socialites as well. Um, so I found it really interesting what he said. What he said. I also want to interject as we move forward into modern life that my husband, not, my husband's grandfather was born here, so my, we come back. We came back full time in '91, but in the late '70s when we were out here. You know, the village had a lot of laws about what you could wear, what you couldn't wear in the village. You know, you couldn't you couldn't wear a bathing suit in the village unless you had something over it. Men could not had to have couldn't have bare chests. Um, you know, you had to have shoes on going into a store. These were actual rules that were printed and put up in the village in signs. Um, I also um, know from my own experience that what we call the Hamptons today really didn't happen until the late night up until about 18, 1993. This was still a very affordable community with a lot of local people that could still afford to stay here. Um, something happened on uh, Wall Street, you know, the money that happened in the 80s spilled over into uh, the Hamptons, and that became what we know as the Hamptons. And I remember people were um, asking to buy your 283 exchanges, <laughs> because if you had a 283 number, that meant you lived in the village. So that's, you know, those are memories that I have about how we've changed from the very social set in the early years, who were very conservative, really, to something quite different now. So this social set, these are some of the places they shopped. Shep Miller, I don't know if you remember that store, was on the corner of Jobs Lane and South Main Street, right at the corner. And you know, all the very high-end people would go there, men and women, for their clothes, Cartier. Saks was originally on Main Street and then moved to where um, that new store is on the corner of um, Hampton Road and um, across from CVS. Okay. Stubbs and Wooten, um, still in business but not in Southampton. Uh, Saks was there when you missed, which I mentioned there. And Hildreth's. Hildreth's was here then early on in the 1800s. So these were the very um, important places that they liked to shop. Now, as we move forward into the modern world today, things changed. Um, with the advent of the 70s, the summer colony receded, as we know. Many people got older, um, and it was taken over by new celebrities and new visitors. In the 1980s, residents, as I tell you, sold their 283 phone numbers in South Village. By 1994, housing prices soared. The advent of the day tripper changed the climate of the village and style. So here's something that was very important to some people, to have a t-shirt that had status on it, as you can see here. You know, um, the Meadow Club, if you, you know, if you could buy one of these shirts at the Meadow Club, people thought that was great to be able to wear one of those. This is also classic in 2009. This doesn't look most unusual, even for today. You know, the, the man in the golf shirt, the white trousers or Bermudas, the navy blue blazer are still important, and the straw fedora, still currently um, good looking, I think. This was in 19, 2014, this was at the Rita Hayward Gala, fundraiser, kickoff party, and notice what these people are wearing. She's just wearing a print dress, nondescript, nothing really sensational. He has a, he looks actually better than she does, I think. He has a nice white um, blazer on, a lot of colored pants are very important. All that patchwork was important. All those fundraisers that you went to in the uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, that's what they were guys for. He was a really good looking guy in his very beautiful colored blazer. This is a doctor who says he always wears socks. He said he doesn't believe in going to Lovers without socks. Maybe because he's a doctor, I don't know. Summer whites. They're all still in stock. The uniform, you know, the Ralph Lauren polo shirt and the khaki shorts and the white sneakers all over. With. If you sit in say a Harbor in the village after dinner, and sit there and watch young people go by, I mean, younger than I am, they all wear white sneakers and they're perfectly white. You must think of that. Another lovely summer whites with a sandal. We know that's still a good look. Straw hat, a necessity, particularly for the heat and sunscreen and all that other stuff. And it looks very good. You can wear it on 
the beach or you can wear it anywhere. Another lovely summer dress and sandals. The summer dress and sandals seems to be a big choice today. And it's the accessories, you know, the mermaid bag, uh, you know, maybe tying your um, scarf around your waist. Um, ballet flats are very au courant, you know, rather than, um, you know, high heels. These are some choices you might use um, for style. You know, sandals, kind of shirt, <coughs> um, sunglasses, of course. And a party on the beach. These two ladies are dressed appropriately um, with what they call You know, again, if there's no one particular rule, it's just what people feel um, comfortable wearing. Here's another uh, ladies go out style shot. Longer dress, perhaps with the mule heel, um, earrings, etc. So you know the advent of the um, of modern days has sort of changed somewhat how we dress. Now, uh, when I was here um, when we, early on, like in the late '90s, um, I wrote, and I kind of have it here because I am on your computer. Um, I wrote a column for this, it's the Independent, the uh, East Hampton Independent, uh, called Wearing It Out. And I wrote it for each summer in 96 and 97. And so some of the things that I noticed, for example, are, haven't changed that much. Um, things like straight leg pants, sleeveless shifts, halter bodices, cropped pedal, we call them pedal pushers, um, sundresses, and the golf jacket. So that hasn't changed much, um, you know, in terms of what people wore. Um, you know, you know, even for like for the going to the Southampton um, parade, people were basically you know trying to be Americana. So the last thing I had here that I wanted to show you was this little cartoon that I found. With these two ladies today. This would read, "Please make me meet everyone in the Hamptons." But in this one, she's saying, "Now she said to her friend, don't make me meet everyone." In so now it's reversed itself from wanting to meet everybody to not. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, when Nina and I were writing our books, um, in our last book, uh, which is over there, The Third of Us, um, we said this is our last book, so we say, we've actually had the best journey in the last three years, um, we miss um, the, the hunt for anyone over 80 who had a story to tell. We'll miss discovering more about Southampton than we knew and learning about the joys of growing up here in a way that sadly no longer exists. So that's really true. Uh, what visitors and tourists fail to realize is that it's the people, these people, our Southampton people, who grew and developed this community and made what we consider Southampton or Southampton style. Uh, I also uh, remember writing this in one of our books. Um, Southampton has changed, it has. But I can still see its allure. Maybe you can too. I remember in the late 80s, early 90s, when I would drive back from Brooklyn where I teach. Um, Thursday afternoon, I would take the LIE at summer. I still had lights all the way out, so I could swing over to the alley. When I passed at 62, there might have been three cars on the road. Now there are hundreds. But if you get off Main Street and walk the village streets at the height of the summer, it's peaceful. So although we know there's been a lot of changes here throughout the years, um, Southampton still retains its bucolic attraction, and the styles do change, and there are new people here. And everybody has their own sense of rules today. There's no one set of rules as to how much you dress. Now, if you look at those two publications I brought, one is the Lost, um, Lost Hamptons, which are a collection of Eric Woodward's postcards that he's collected over the years, you may have gone to one of his lectures, and in that you'll see a lot of beautiful scenes, as well as the a book about the William Merritt Chase School of Painting, which I've also brought with me. So I tell you to take a look at that, and please, if maybe you have some questions or comments you'd like to make about what you've seen here in Southampton in your time. Some of you have lived here a long time. I, I see familiar faces, and I know you have Oh, I just, you know, I did grow up here in Southampton Village, and I remember growing up, we all, and I think I mentioned it to you, we always 
noticed that you could tell the people who were really from the Hamptons by the way they dressed was very, um, very casual and there's a word that I can't pull up right now. Whereas you could tell people that were visiting were just so overdone. <laughs> the Hamptons to me has always been very understated, that was the word, just a very understated style, but we always noticed that, you know, there were the shoes, even if they were very understated, their shoes we knew were worth more than right. <laughs> a lot or their bag was a lot but it just it was very nice that i always felt that we kind of knew who belonged here you know by the right, very right, casual right. relaxed yeah well as you saw even the early summer colony people were very concerned for the way they dressed yeah compared to what we might see today you know anything that, like you want to make a comment anything anything yeah oh uh, well i have uh, one thing to say about how people came out here. You said in the 90s. Well, I, I don't know when exactly the Long Island Expressway was finished, but to him to base, that's when people really, once that road went through, when well, they broke through, yeah. Because going to New York prior to that, you had to go up to Catch Off yeah. and go over to Smithtown. Yeah, I think my there. husband's, my, my father always used to say that. Yeah, that's so that one thing. Um, the other thing, I think some of the rules of what people were on their feet in the 50s had a lot to do with polio. The scare of polio, where you bathe when you went to the beach and you walked in the village. Uh, I know my mother was very concerned, and so were other people. So the vaccine came in the middle, in the 50s. Uh, early 50s. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that also lifted the burden. Well, anything like that, um, our pandemic is the same thing. We're living through somewhat similar yes, circumstances. Yes, but it changed, it changed yeah. everything with yeah. the polio vaccine. It as did. far as people did. going to the beach, yeah. whether they swam in a pool. Well, that's true today, too. People are very cautious about swimming in a pool that's not their own, let's say, right. because they're worried about, you know, contamination. So I think people are still very cautious about it. I know one person that you we know did get home. Um, yeah. She was she before the vaccine. She was older, so it was unfortunate. Right. So I can understand that. Yeah, yeah. but it, it did change things. But I do want to tell you, I did grow up here, and um, I would ride my bike like everybody else. And in the early fifth, what I can tell you, it must have been 1956. Elizabeth Arden store was also here, right. and they had a beauty salon. And one day, I was driving my bike in the village, and I see a group of other kids in front of Elizabeth Arden. So I thought, I asked somebody what was going on. They said Marilyn Monroe was inside. <laughs> well, that'll draw a crowd. <laughs> well, it was so just kids. Yeah. Kids on their bike. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Well, sure so yeah. I thought, well, I'm going to wait because I'd like to see her. <laughs> and sure enough, she came out so beautiful. Yeah. She was dressed in jeans. like to the ankle with a plaid shirt and tie. And of course, she looked gorgeous. She stopped, she talked to the kids. She went across the street down into her 56 red Thunderbird. Nice, nice her, memory. Her uh, uh, bodyguard was with her, and he was driving. So I would, I would watch them go down to meet Castling. And just Castling, First Presbyterian Church, his car stopped, they got out of the switch, and she drove. Oh, that's really cute. And that's when she was living in Amagansett with uh, Arthur, Miller. Arthur Miller. And of course, the rest is history, right? Yeah. What a cool memory. But it was, well, it was yeah. such a great oh, memory. So cool. Yeah, yeah, that is great, because we had, we had so many famous people. And then Elton here. John wrote a song right. about Marilyn Monroe, right. and he said he said it. I would have liked to have known you, but I was just a kid. And that's how I felt, you know? Yeah, well, we've had a lot of, well, because of what we are, it draws a lot of people here. But the traffic is true, you know, until the highways came through, it, was, it took a long time to get here. And so, you know, it was, and it wasn't really a thing in, the, in those days, you know? Well, I think it was 
very inaccessible for a long time to a lot of people. So once the high there really was no place for people to stay. You know, if you look at um, in terms of motels, you know, there aren't it really was hardly anything. There's still very few places where one can stay today, you know. So that are not at fortune, a few things like Southampton Inn, the seventeen seventy eight, I think. Um, there are a few places on the highway, but you know, you really had to know somebody to stay with or stay someplace else and drive in. Um, yes, Adrian. Along with the watching the differences in the clothing, if you notice, the buy tops have changed. Oh, of course. It's, you know, and you said, well, what happened? Why is it, you know, that America, the waist America's is got larger. It, it has, I mean, has I'm not to do a, with the uh, a types of biologist or, a, you know, but I know that, you know, when the Americans are healthier, nutrition, um, also we have access to more things that maybe we should be eating, you know, so we might be oh, yeah. um, And so, you know, we are larger than we should be. You know, if you even lived in the city, as I did growing up, Kid and took the subways, the early subways, the seats were really narrow. Mm -hmm. You know, today you could not put two people in those seats, it just would be too small. So that also affected the styles yes. because then sure. Absolutely. the styles had to change along right. with the size of people's waist no. lines. I think it was with the writers when they write. Pollock, of course, when he went out there, you know, but I think it was always more of an artistic haven than Southampton, I think, except for William Cherry and Chase. Um, and so I think they drew a lot of, um, because it was a very beautiful place to be, and um, it was probably less expensive to find some place to set up a studio, certainly. Uh, if you've gone out to Springs, and you, the right hand road, Springs Fireplace Road, and you go far all the way down to to the harbor is the um, Pollock Studio, which is it, it, it draws people to the beautiful. It's inspirational. 